applause the eyes and pull like a dog. <laughs> And a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam McGuire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All Ireland champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. On today's podcast we're going to be reflecting on the life and times of Jack Charlton, the former Republic of Ireland manager who sadly passed away on Saturday. We'll be joined in a few minutes by freelance sports journalist Joe McCarthy to look back on what remains a golden era of Irish soccer and Irish life. Before that though Kieran, let's quickly reflect on what has been a crazy few days on the local GEA scene. On Thursday evening, the news broke that Argentine Rangers decided to press pause on all group club activities as a precautionary measure after a number of club members believed they were in contact with a person who subsequently confirmed to have COVID-19. Balnascarty soon followed their lead before St. Oliver Blunkett's became the third West Cork club to halt activities for a few days. Just a few days later, all three clubs were given the all clear to resume activities. Kieran, something like this was bound to happen when the return to play commenced. Can you maybe bring us up to speed on where we stand now? Yeah, um, like you mentioned there, the three local clubs, there was Argentine Rangers, Ben Escarpty and St. Oliver Plunkett's. They all temporarily suspended club activities because um, club members informed them that they were in touch with someone who subsequently tested positive for COVID-19. So for a start, the three clubs, they took the, the, the right steps, they moved swiftly, they acted responsibly. They put the welfare of their, their their players, their members and their communities before everything else. Um, so each club, like I said, they did the right thing at the right time. And thank God all the results came back negative, which was great. But it's just a warning, Jack. I think it serves as a, as a big warning to every club in the division and even right, right around the country as to what potentially might happen in the weeks ahead. Because not only was it the three clubs, um, the three clubs in, in question that were affected, but the ripple effect across West Cork GA last weekend was huge. The, the number of other GA clubs that also stopped senior, minor and junior training for a couple of days and so on. And the Carberry Camogie team have pulled out of the county uh, senior Camogie championship because of what we done last week. It kind of set off alarm bells there in case this happens in a couple of weeks' time and the effects it could have on several clubs in West Cork. Um, the ripple effects were felt right throughout the division and it's a big wake up call I think every club and every player in West Cork needs to see what happened last weekend and they really need to act responsibly from here on in we all have to be even with COVID-19 as it is Jack it's kind of it's, it's here at the moment and as we go about our everyday life we all need to take kind of the personal responsibility for the actions that we take to kind of whether that's to, to kind of to mind the the vulnerable, vulnerable people that we know will just do the right thing and now more than ever, the GA community needs to do that as well, because it could have a big effect in the championship in a couple of weeks' time if a similar situation arises. Well, it's a point you raised um, last week, and I think you've raised it over the last number of weeks, and it's something you just touched on there. Do we have any clarity on what will happen if, in the days leading up to a championship game, we'll say on a Wednesday before a Saturday game, a member of a club team reports to have tested positive or reports to have symptoms will what do we do we know what will happen will the entire club have to be withdrawn from the championship or have any guidelines been yet set out for a, a an incident such as that we're still waiting on the protocol to come down from Crow park and i think they need to come in at asap because what last weekend highlighted um the situation in west cork is it, it created such fear and panic in other clubs um because if this happens in two weeks' time, nobody knows what could happen. Like you said there, do the clubs have to put out in a championship? Maybe they have to forfeit the game that they were meant to play that that weekend. Do the players in question, um, if they have to get COVID tested, must they self-isolate for 14 days? And could they possibly miss miss games as well? We're still waiting for kind of clear definition from Pro Park. And I think that's expected this week. And um, I, I think it's needed too, Jack, because there was such confusion last weekend when all of this news broke um, like I said there was clubs a, a number of clubs who just stopped training 
entirely because maybe they were in contact with players from 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 Bell and Argadine and Plunkett's in challenge games and so on. So everybody just pressed pause to see what the results of the tests were. Thankfully, they came back negative. So every, everybody's resumed again. But just because the West Cork GA story or the COVID story has moved on from West Cork, the lessons have to be learned. And we need to be very careful in the weeks ahead and very responsible because it could potentially jeopardise a club's championship season. Yeah, and I think an important point you make as well about being open and honest as well, because the three clubs that formed the, the, the or the three clubs you mentioned there, Bal, Aggerine Rangers and uh, remind me of Plunkett. and Plunkett, sorry, um, they all acted swiftly. They announced quickly that they were going to halt activities until they could review the situation, and then within a couple of days. Everything was clear. They were back training. The last thing you want is for a club to know within within the club that a player may or may not have tested positive or come into contact and then batten down the hatches in the old GAA way. So I think it's important to just make that point that because there is fear, there is panic, but there shouldn't necessarily be. All, this was always going to happen when GAA resumed because you have big groups of young people mixing together and I know the protocols are followed to a great degree but there are going to be some breaches for better or worse so it's just uh, an inevitability that there are going to be some positive tests within GA clubs so the important thing is just to manage them correctly 100% Jack you're back on the money there kind of the last thing we want is for players in a GA club to kind of maybe be in contact with someone who has or had COVID-19 and that those players are tested within that club not to kind of was share that knowledge with their community and maybe clubs that they played in challenge games because, like, if that starts happening, it's um, it's it's just not good. It, it, for a start, it's not being kind of honest and open, um, which every club needs to be right here because there's no shame in this. You know, COVID nineteen is just a virus that's right across the world and people are getting sick from it. it um, the virus doesn't choose who it wants to affect; it's just there. So there's no shame in in players um, kind of picking up maybe COVID-19 or being in contact with someone who had COVID-19. I just think everyone needs to be open and honest here um, because we all want we all want the same thing. We all want their people to be first fit, healthy and the welfare of the communities is the priority. But we'd all love to see sport back as well. Like we waited long enough for um, for the soccer season to kick back in, for the GA season to kick back in. So um, I just think a bit of bit of honesty and openness would go a long way and it's it's actually great to see in the last couple of days I just see their Douglas GA club on Twitter put out a message on Monday kind of mentioning that any club members that are coming back from traveling abroad will be asked to stay away from training and matches for 14 days so they are again great move by Douglas for acting responsibly they're laying down the law as per GA guidelines if 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 you're if you go outside the guidelines they're going to ask you to, to not train or not play for 14 days so that's the right thing to do. We just have to put the welfare, health and safety of people above the result of a football or hurling match. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the last thing we want is for sport to be put on hold again. I was back playing for the first time in, I suppose, four months last Wednesday night in a hurling challenge game. And just to be back out on the field, chatting with your teammates, even chatting with your opponents, it was brilliant. It was a great feeling. It's something that you forget how much you enjoy when there's a gap of four months and I have to say the protocols that were in place for our championship game down in Rossa Park we were taking on Clonakilty or Donovan Rossa Clonakilty in a hurling game and the protocols were all followed to a T everyone acted responsibly we had to send in a message before the game with the return to play form filled out on the GAA website you couldn't be considered for selection unless you filled that out and sent it in everything else was thought of there was hand sanitizer no water bottles to be shared so the key thing is to keep this show on the road just act responsibly and we'll get the championship played and we can have a scalp off a few lads along the way but Kieran, let's leave that conversation there for now as we said it's great to have sport back and coming up after the break we're going to reflect on the life and times of Jackie Charlton with Jer McCarthy thanks for listening to the star sport podcast number one for sport in west cork now we're going to switch our attention to the sad passing of former Republic of Ireland manager Jack Charlton. Joining us on the line to reflect on Jack's career is freelance sports journalist Ger McCarthy. There's been blanket coverage of Jack's death across both the Irish and British media since the news broke on Saturday and it's almost as if 
we've entered a period of collective mourning for one of our best loved sporting figures. To kick us off, Jer, you might just give us your own personal reflections and memories of Jack and particularly his time as Ireland manager. Um oh god, Jack, that's a, that's 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 a tough question. There's so many of them. I, I think I was fortunate enough to be a genera I was sixteen years old when the um when when, uh, when it was happening and I was old enough to know old enough to understand how crap the football was and young enough to just try and fathom what was going on around me in Clonakilty. Um people hanging out of cars, people banging on the tops of cars, people coming out into the street, people drinking, everyone happy. Never before have I encountered people who I wouldn't assume have any interest in soccer back then. And I was a big I've always been big into my soccer. Knew the ins and outs of the Romanian back four. Knew what was happening with the Italian team. Knew all about this guy called Toto Scalacci who jumped onto the scene. It was it was just a lovely, lovely time. And you mentioned there that there's been blanket coverage in the media, and there has, and rightly so. And I think for people like yourself who, who didn't live through it, you can get a bit boring hearing old farce like myself and Karen going on about it. And I was thinking about what I was going to say in the podcast to try and make you understand. And the truth is, it wasn't actually about the football. It wasn't actually about Jack Charlton at all. It was about a country whose economy was in the, in, in the crap, for want of a better term, who didn't have an awful lot to show about for a good decade and who a generation actually had to emigrate, both to America and Australia, a lot of people that I know. And I was thinking about it, if I'd been born, maybe if I'd been born 10 years earlier, I might not have been around for Italian 90. I could have been in America, I could have been in Australia. There was no jobs. And when you emigrated in that time period, you emigrated. You couldn't come home because a lot of people were there illegally, both in, in places like London, places like Australia and America. So 1990, Euro 88, and Italian 90 specifically when Jack Charlton came along, was a reason to party, was a reason to be happy, was a reason to get excited, and let's be honest, was a reason to get drunk. And it was one big massive party, and the football was kind of important, you know, but when it, when it was all over, it was the first time I can remember as a 16 to an 18 year old, the country feeling good about itself. And the big thing, the big thing that I remember most and my final point on it from that period, up until then, Jack, the tricolour was associated with the IRA and the tricolour was associated with the troubles. And I, you never saw much of the tricolour. You saw it in GA matches when you stand to attention for Oran Levine and a badly recorded tape recording. But people didn't generally bring out the tricolour, maybe for St. Patrick's Day. It was everywhere. It was everywhere from 88 to 1990, 94 and beyond. And people were proud to have it around their shoulders. And people were proud to be Irish. And proud of the way the fans behaved. And we haven't even touched on the football. And I haven't even mentioned Jack Charlton in the last couple of minutes to you. But that's what he did. He did it. He got a team playing agricultural football. He figured out international teams. Didn't like being put under pressure, pardon the pun. And we went on a roll for about a 10-year period. And prior to that, just to finish the point, it's worth noting, Ireland were very unfortunate not to qualify under own hand and other managers for championships. They were done out of it, <clears throat> done out of it. And I'm a bit, I'm, a, I'm actually too young. I was a bit too young to remember all that. But being in the middle of it as a 16-year-old and watching what was going on around me was absolutely beautiful. It was so much fun, really so much fun. We'd never experienced anything like before. I don't know if we'll experience anything like it again. We'll try. You'll try and mimic it from now on, which we've done in, in subsequent kind of championships. But he was the, the catalyst for it. He was the catalyst for, as I think Vincent Hogan said brilliantly, and Malachi Clerken alluded to, alluded to it as well. It was all right to feel good about yourself as an Irish person, you know. Um, and it was just, it was some crack. Absolutely. Um, Declan Lynch said in yesterday's Sunday Independent that it was the greatest thing to ever happen to the country and Kieran, I'm unfortunately too young to remember it to remember much of Jack's time at Ireland I was born in 1991 as Jura said about nine months after the Romania penalty <laughs> shootout but because of how big those moments are I almost feel as though I did live through them you're writing about Jack in this week's Southern Star so what are your own memories of those Halasan days I've got to say in this week's star, Jack, I think that uh, um, that big Jack kind of provided the soundtrack to my childhood. Um, I'm not as old as Jor, he's eight years of me, but I, I was just turned eight years of age at the start of Italia 90. And my memories before that, I don't have any memories, to be quite honest, but it's, I suppose sport has this knack of bookmarking your life. And I have 
very kind of clear and vivid memories of Italian 90 and especially that first game against England and when Kevin Sheehy got the goal and I just ran outside the garden down to the back garden and, and I we six apple trees there was two rows of tree and the back three apple trees were always safe the apples were safe but the, the amount of apples that fell off those front three trees is incredible because it was just kicking the ball and pretending I was Kevin Sheehy you know and then um, it's just those memories that spring to mind when I think of Jack Charlton um, because he gave us so much joy. Like I was an eight year old and I was probably falling in love with sport. And as an eight year old in Kerry, where GA is almost kind of second nature, it was always the soccer that I ventured towards. And I was starting to think, I suppose, over the weekend, kind of, I am more interested in soccer than I was in football growing up. And I think it was down to 10 and 90 because my first proper introduction to sport was Jack Charlton's team because at the time the Kerry footballers weren't going through a kind of a great patch. It was the the great famine of the time. But then Jack's army came along and all of a sudden we had a team to celebrate, a team to watch. And um, I remember a couple of months after the Italian 90, Ireland played England in a Euro 92 qualifying game and the kickoff was half one. It was a, it was a, it was a school day. But everyone in the school poured into the hall to watch Ireland versus England in, in that um, qualifier that was on a Lansdowne Road. And that never happened before. But that was all because of what Jack did with that Ireland team and the euphoria people felt after Italia 90. So um, he lit up so many childhoods. He really did. And that's why it was so sad to hear his passing on Saturday. And I just threw up a tweet with put him under pressure because that song... It takes me back to the early 90s. But even now, it still makes me smile. It's a brilliant song. And it almost, it captures what it was like back at that time. And even right through the 90s. It was incredible stuff. There was a great documentary shown again on RTE last night. It was uh, by the director, Ross Whitaker, called The Boys in Green, which is, I, I thought, captured the time really well. I almost was emotional watching it, welling up, despite, as I said, not being alive for the height of it. But just... To touch on something you said a few minutes ago, Ger, about the actual style of football, which I suppose is something worth talking about because he was often criticised at the time within the Irish media, for, in particular by Eamon Dunphy, as most people will know, for the style of football that the Irish teams played at Euro 88 and the World Cup. But like in hindsight, that argument seems totally out of kilter because it was Ireland's first ever major tournament. They were hardly going to go out and play like Maradona's Argentina. So... At the time, Ger, you said you were in, in, interested in soccer then, you were 16, so you would have been probably quite nerdy when it came to tactics, etc., as most 16-year-old soccer fans are. So when you look back on it now, were you kind of in the Aim and Dunphy camp or could you see the, the pragmatism of Jack? And also, in hindsight, that pragmatism obviously seems like it was the right, the, the right move for the time. Um, that's a very good question. I, I remember distinctly defending Dunphy on a couple of occasions, getting into quite a bit of trouble for it and saying, ah, you're just one trying to be like him. I guess what it boils down to is, okay, Jack Charlton, for people who don't know, prior to becoming a manager, was a really, really good television pundit. He was very, very good on ITV in his day, and he, he was very honest, and he knew his stuff. John Giles actually said it in Off the Ball, I think it was yesterday or last night, people don't give him enough credit for being as smart as he is. And I always remember a quote from Johan Cruyff, the great Dutch player, who, when he was asked about playing Jack Charlton, he said, he started laughing. He said, don't make me laugh about Jack Charlton. People go on about him not knowing how to play football. I know exactly what he's thinking about when he goes fishing. He's working teams out and he knows how to, give, he knows how to win. When, he, when Jack was a pundit for ITV, he went to the Mexico World Cup in 1986 and he said he took a big book, as he called it, with him and wrote down all. He watched most of the teams and what he garnered from it was they all played the same way. Flat back four, all might have one or two world-class players that they feed the ball through and they come at you. He came up with the idea. I mean, the label put him under pressure is unfortunate because he actually was, as Miguel Delaney wrote about the Independent, actually brilliantly yesterday. He said he was the first kind of manager at international level to come up with the pressing game that the likes of Guardiola and Klopp are now lauded for. Now, granted, it wasn't in the same, you know, focus of picking out a player and three players running towards him. But Charlton quickly realised that if you got the ball in behind a flat back four and turned the opposition around, they'd have to change the way they played to deal with you. And... Jack was a lot of things, but he was not for turning when he had his mind made up. And the generation of Irish players, the big criticism of Jack was 
that's fine if that's the way you want to play. And if it's effective and if it gets us to Euro 88 and if it, like it did and if it got us to Tanya 90, that's all great. But there are days when you look at the team sheet, Paul McGrath, Mark Lawrence, Ronnie Whelan, you know, they'd walk into any international team at that time. We can play a bit of football too. And we did in Euro 88, as a matter of fact, but we didn't play enough of it. And it all came to a head, I guess, in the Egyptian game, in Italian 90. It was one of the worst 90 minutes of my life. Now, that World Cup, in terms of quality, was dreadful, Italian 90. It actually led to the changing of the rules of the back pass, which came in after, I think it was Euro 92, it finally came in, where they stopped the back pass, where you could be under pressure on your halfway line and lamp it back to the keeper. And the, the goals per game average was very low for that particular World Cup in 1990. And I was watching this, I wanted to be entertained. I wanted to get excited. And you, you're kind of drawn along by the Irish games, which is fine. But a lot of the other games, it was 1-0, it was 2-1, it was, you know, 2-1 like that. It was very it was very Italian, actually, for where it was. So I praise Jack for coming up with a way that made us effective and got us to all these championships and put us at one point in the top 10 world-ranked countries, ranked countries of the world in football. It's fantastic to even think that. But yeah, we could have played with the players we had and some of the players he left out. We could have done, made, the question is, could we have done the same thing, if not better, with Brady in midfield, with O'Leary centre-back? Those kind of questions always hung around him, Jack. And he wasn't for turning. And he got very aggressive about it when you tried to ask him about a plan B. But I suppose the final point is, under Jack Charlton and the agricultural way he had of playing, it was effective 99% of the time. But as time wore on, when you were playing in Egypt and they had 11 behind the ball, that wasn't going to work. And when you were playing in Liechtenstein in the subsequent European Championship qualifiers, you know they got their first point ever against us away. When you didn't have a plan B and you had all these great players, that's when it started to unravel a bit. But where he took us from 1986, and I remember pre-1986, there was one or two qualifiers where it was brilliant and we came close. From 86 to 96, it was an astonishing run at international level. And he was ahead of his time in that he figured out a way to be effective and to turn teams around and to take away their weapons and make them change the way they play if they wanted to compete against Ireland. And... Looking back on it now, it was a very brave thing to do because he knew the criticism would come. He just didn't care. And it was, you know, pig-headed to stick with it. But then that was him. But if you're asking me, would I change? Would I rather have had those 10 years of pretty shite football and all the experiences that went on around it or play lovely football and get nowhere? I'd take the farmer. Of course you take the farmer. You take all the excitement and the drama and the drink and the crack. That was what it was all about. Um and a lot of people didn't care, but I did care because it was a dreadful World Cup to watch, 1990. But who cares when you get to the quarterfinals? Do you think, sure that we were sorry, that we were missing a top class centre forward? I saw some interview with Tony Cascarino, and if you look at our, our forwards back then, with Cascarino, Quinn, with David Kelly, and so on, John Aldridge, obviously, and but that pressing game, we didn't have an outstanding world class centre forward like in the. The more that Gary Lineker back then, I, I just saw a piece in the party too. Well, big mid- Frank Stapleton, was he kind of a... He was on the way out at that stage. Yeah, he so was like, coming his career. It seemed we were missing that kind of, that, that goal poacher who could get a goal out of nowhere. And if we had that, kind of, would, would that have made a difference? Um, I, I'd slightly disagree with you on that. And I think Aldridge, when he was at Liverpool, was going through an absolutely brilliant phase of his career. He was scoring goals all around him until Ian Rush came back and having gone away and replaced him again. But Aldridge always tells the story that his first job as the number nine or number 10, whichever jersey he was wearing, was to get into the corners and put pressure on the fullbacks. So it was completely alien to the game. He played at Liverpool where he had John Barnes, Peter Beersley, uh, Ronnie Whelan, uh, Jan Molby feeding him ball after ball in quality positions. And he was a poacher. But we never played to Aldridge's strengths. But he didn't mind that because he knew what Jack wanted out of him. And as long as he did what Jack wanted, he went 23, 24 internationals without scoring a goal, Kieran. What international forward would get away with that now he scored the two goals against Malta that confirmed we would go to Italian 90 but prior to that there was a 25 26 internationals where Aldridge was lucky to get a chance let alone get a goal so I think we had a player of that quality but we didn't use it but what we didn't have and you're right to say is like Jack was saying when Stapleton was too old it was David Kelly coming in from West Ham who wasn't really a world class quality he was a great striker scored against him in 95 before that game was called off because of the hooligans but we didn't have, I don't think we had, we had a core 12, 13 players. But after that, we didn't have enough experience. And it, it takes time to cycle those players in. And it didn't really happen between the late mid-90s as, as it had happened when he took over first. But had we played a more progressive way, I think we'd have gotten a lot more out of, even Niall Quinn playing up front alongside Aldridge. 
uh, and playing 4-4-2 the way they were used to it for their clubs, we might have gotten more goals. But Aldridge was very, very clear in his role. Close down the opposite, the opposing defence, get into the box for crosses and any free kicks, try and nick something. And it took him nearly 25 internationals to score, so that just tells you. So I don't think it would have mattered if we had, because uh, he wouldn't have played him the way he should have played him anyway. But it is interesting that we've been more or less having the same debates about the Irish national team ever since. It's like uh, we resort to a practical style of play and live for the big moments. Like you had um, the World Cup in 2002 where we got to draw with Germany. Then the Shane Long goal when they beat Germany in Lansdowne Road to a game against Italy. Joe, we live for these moments. So whatever way, obviously it looks like we're going to go down a different style with the next management but we'll see how long that lasts hopefully it will um kieran just to touch on then the moments as i as, as i mentioned there there were so many big ones under jack Charlton. we spoke about italian 90 there was obviously the victory against england at euro 88 and giant stadium where they beat italy at the 94 world cup for you as a youngster which one stands out the most and can you maybe tell us where you were when you watched it I know you mentioned one earlier on when you ran down the garden with the apple trees but maybe some of your other memories I actually think it's Pecky Bonner's save against Tamafti in the in the last 16 in, in Genoa that is I remember getting the poster the poster after and the poster was on the wall for I don't know how long after and that was an amazing moment that's one of those kind of picture perfect moments of Irish sport that we'll always go back to in 50 years time it'll still be one of our standout moments because like um, I'm, I'm going to get this right. The nation held its breath, or you know, this this quote, George George Hamilton's like that's just a piece of folklore. And again, it was in the sitting room at home. And whether it's nostalgia or not, when I'm looking back on the summers of the '90s and even that summer of 1990, it was a summer. I remember it, it was hot, it was warm, the sun was shining. I don't know. Again, is that just the the rose tinted glasses that we look back on now? But the '90s just there seemed a far warmer kind of decade you know it was far more simplistic um it was far more fun kind of as well to the way, the way I see it. And part of that was the memories that sport was giving us like that that um uh, bother save from Daniel Tomofti because that was incredible um absolutely incredible just watching in the sitting room at home with the family and I think that's what Jack Charlton's Ireland did as well it just brought us all together because whether you were a GA person whether you any interest in soccer whatsoever Everybody watched Ireland in that World Cup. And the more we went on, the momentum built. And the nation did kind of come to a stop for those games. Um, but even after, I have a couple of memories from the Italy game. And Paul McGrath had a header in the in the game against Italy. Um, if my memory serves me co- correct. Uh, like I was only eight at the time, so forgive me if I'm wrong. But I think McGrath had a great game that night in defence. But I think he had a chance in the second half, Jordan Tate, from a header. He did, yeah. Himself and Quinn, they had two really yeah. good chances, yeah. That wasn't too far away, and that just sticks in my head as well. But it's these little moments that um, probably could have been moments when you think of, of that that that, that um, quarterfinal against Italy. We could have could have snatched something in that game. But for me, it was Bonner save from Tomoff. I think that, for me, that just sums up Charlton's, um, Charlton's era. It was just a special moment. Well, that's something that is often said about that team. And, Jerry, you touched on it a bit earlier where if we had decided to go a more progressive route, we could have won the World Cup. Who knows? Hmm. <laughs> I didn't yeah. say that. No, no but think back to, you, think you, back you, you, Joe, in, in terms of, they, they, yeah. you, so you said there was more in that yeah. team, possibly, and then I obviously exaggerate by saying they could have won the World Cup. I'm almost happy they didn't, because I would have hated to have missed yeah. out on her winning the World Cup. But, Joe, then, just in terms of your standout memory from Jack's tenure with Ireland which one would you go along with Kieran the Packy Bonner save or as you mentioned you were probably a good age to be watching your 88 as well so that must have been a big one as well considering it was the first big yeah. moment uh, I mean 88 to be fair in the European Championships I, and I keep alluding back to it that was very strange everybody kind of stopped in their tracks because we'd never qualified before there was an expectation level in 1990 that we could have a go and might actually do something and the English game that started it all off was horrific um, nothing really important. The Egyptian game should never be put on television again. And an often forgotten memory of the Dutch game, which was our third group game, is that when it got to 1-1 and England were beating Egypt in the corresponding fixture of the final group game, if everything stayed the way it was, both Ireland and the Dutch were guaranteed to go through. So Ruth Hullett and Mick McCarthy met in the middle of the pitch and the camera showed them, had a chat, and all of a sudden... Both teams stopped playing. Um, knocking it around, 
pass it back to the goalkeeper. The ref brought the two captains in together and told them either start playing or there's going to be trouble. They half kind of made a half-hearted attempt, ran out the final 15, 20 minutes, and and we both we both got through. And Egypt, I remember, were being up in arms. And it's an un, it's I know it's not a positive memory, but it's an unusual memory. But I always remember thinking that's not really good sportsmanship. But I really don't care <laughs> because now we're actually through. And I think the whole country felt that way. Now, if you reverse it, and had the English and the Egyptians done that to us, I I think you could have had another war. But anyway, um, my my fondest memory is actually the like Kieran is the Romanian game because like Kieran, I was at home with my family and it's gas how many memories people come back up with saying we were in the kitchen we were in the living room I don't really remember who was there I just know I was at home and when Bonner made the save I actually I was still having palpitations from Tony Cascarino's miss kick because that penalty he actually kicked the ground first I remember him re- reading about in his autobiography and I was thinking God this might not be our day and the last the one thing I always always remember is Dave O'Leary go up to get to take the penalty and Roddy Doyle wrote in the van uh, about the character in the van in the actual book saying O'Leary scored and I turned around and all I could see were people jumping around he was describing the scene in a Dublin pub in a big giant screen people were jumping but I wasn't sure were they happy or angry and I looked on the screen and there was all these green jerseys running onto the pitch and I didn't know if they were running on to kick the crap out of O'Leary for missing or congratulate him for scoring but there was so much history with O'Leary and Charlton and Ireland and all that it was a lovely moment for him and I'm no Arsenal supporter, but it was a, it was just a nice moment for O'Leary. And that really probably was the highlight because I didn't expect us to beat Italy. We played brilliantly against them, as Karen said there. We, we really could have. We, we played absolutely brilliantly against them. But that Romanian game, the penalties, the excitement, the drama, Hadji, Genoa being turned into an Irish home game, that does stick out. But I've never forgotten that Dutch 20 minutes that nobody likes to talk about. That's still there as well. Yeah, that's a great one. I would have loved to have been watching that and for the same reason what's great when Ireland are doing it but yeah imagine England and Egypt we'd still be talking about it now yes. um, Kier, now just final word before we wrap up this chat I wanted to just get uh, you, you. I seen you mentioning on Twitter about Big Jack's connection to West Cork and as they say every story is local so we'll have to uh, elbow in a West Cork link here so tell us about that link it's just after, obviously, when, when Jack Charlton passed away Saturday, I just went on the archives just to see Jack Charlton Southern Star. And it turns out that he was a, it was a familiar visitor down this neck of the woods. And was that's no surprise to, to anyone. I think he could have reached into every corner of the country. And there was an angling competition for disabled um, disabled uh, fishermen um, that he used to, d- d- disabled angler, sorry, that he used to run in Bentry and he was a patron of that and he used to come down and he was a really popular figure when he was when he was down in West Cork and he was at the Bandon Festival in 1991 and there was other visits too. So um, he was just, uh, when, whenever Jack Charlton went anywhere, and we've learned this over the years, he was such a big draw. We've heard stories about Ray Houghton and Dave Valeri and Jack Charlton are walking down the street together and they're stopped a hundred times and everybody stops to talk to Jack Charlton, not the two boys either side. It's just, he was such a kind of charismatic figure and he did so much for Irish sports. He was kind of, he's more Irish, I suppose. He's more loved than a lot of Irish people are. You know, he's our favourite Englishman. Um, you know, kind of, he came over here and he transformed Irish soccer and the fact that he's known by his first name, Jack, 30 years on, it tells you all we need to know about him but yeah he was he was down in West Cork he was a popular figure down here but um, that's a story that's kind of told all over the country too Jack absolutely well thanks and million. actually be- oh, before, before before you push on you just said there that you were born nine months after the Romania game <laughs> and I just noticed oh your name is Jack hmm. so I wonder I wonder was, was that in homage to the great Jack Charlton that's something you might have to ask Mr and Mrs McCarron in your, your next phone call oh, home but there's, there's a possible story there Jack I Love will, but, you know, funny enough, that only dawned on me today as well, because my parents, my parents would tell the story that I was a child of the Italian 90, um, but never did I put two and two together with the name Jack until this morning when I knew we were going to have this conversation. So I'll have to confirm that ahead of next week's <laughs> podcast. But anyway, thanks a million to Jur for joining us. Some lovely memories there of the big man. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, number one for sport in West Cork. Now, before we wrap up today's edition of the Star Sport Podcast, Kieran is going to give us a quick rundown of what to expect in this week's Southern Star Sports section. So, Kieran, take it away. 
plenty going on this week, Jack. Um, Pride of Place, we have a two-page feature on Newstown Camogie. In a couple of weeks' time, Newstown will be playing their first ever senior Camogie championship game. And Ger McCarthy caught up with three players, um, Mary McSweeney, Maeve Lynch and Evelyn Crowley, just for a chat about Newstown rise to the senior ranks. So some really good stuff in there, really enjoyable read. And um, it's just a nod to Newstown because as a rural GA club, they now have senior teams, men's football, men's hurling. And, and senior Camogie, which is an incredible feat for, for New Sistone. So that's that's well worth to read this Thursday. Also, as well as that, the West Cork League is kicking back into action this weekend. And we've caught up with Mark Buckley, the Dun, Dunmanway Town striker, and Don, he's footballer and hurler, just for a chat about how he's going to juggle, I suppose, all these sporting commitments over the, the next couple of weeks. So that's good stuff, and it's good to see the... The West Cork League coming back into action this weekend. Um, also, Dennis Hurley has an interesting piece with Ross Cashman. He's a Kilbritton hurler, but he's also the club's COVID-19 officer. So Ross talks us through what's involved as a COVID-19 officer. So he's a he's a pretty busy man at the moment. We obviously have coverage of, I suppose, the the, the COVID fallout from 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 West Cork last week. Just um, we have a couple of bits on that, so that's well worth checking in for. And, and also, um, on Sunday week, Jack, the, the big Carberry Rangers and Castlehaven Premier Senior Football Championship game will be live on TV. Um, it's going to be on TG4 on, on Sunday week, so we have a bit about that as well. So there's, there's plenty going on in, in this week's Southern Star, including my own tribute to, to, to the great Jack Charlton. Um, that's the last word column. So, as usual, it's action-packed. We have 16 pages of the, the best in West Cork sport, and it's winning, winging its way all our readers on Thursday morning yeah and if you can't make it to a shop in West Cork just jump online and you can pick up the Southern Star digital edition for as little as two euro per week just go on to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e paper and just to mention as well that there's a free 72 page magazine in this week's Southern Star it's called support West Cork shop local and it's absolutely packed full of information about businesses and tourism in west cork mm. as the region begins to reopen so that's well worth picking up the southern star for this week as well thanks for listening to this week's star sport podcast we'll be back at the same time next week if you enjoy these shows please make sure to rate review and subscribe on itunes spotify youtube google podcasts acast stitcher or wherever else you listen to the show